Great. So we'll start off with a new hydraulics lecture. We'll have some new learning goals for today. We're going to become familiar with pressure filters. And we're going to become familiar with uh, different ways of arranging the filters in a system. We'll also uh, learn about the bypass filtering, uh, how that works. We're going to become familiar with contamination indicators. We've briefly mentioned contamination indicators in the last lecture. Now we're actually going to, to look a bit at how they work. We're going to know how to determine the differential pressure of a pressure filter. And we're going to become familiar with cooling, with heating, and that's it for today. Hopefully we get through everything. So we're going to look at the pressure filters first. <coughs> so last week we went through uh, a lot of the other uh, filter types. So now we continue with pressure filters. And these are installed upstream, which means before uh, contamination sensitive components. So upstream uh, is basically if you, if you think a river, if you're upstream a river, that's where the water is before it reaches you. So downstream will be after it's reached you. So and that's uh, the terminology often used to describe where something is in relation to something else in a hydraulic system. So this filter will be, uh, will be installed after the pump, so inside the, the hydraulic system itself, uh, but then before uh, components in the system that are especially contamination sensitive. And they are uh, subjected to the maximum operating pressure of the system. So they have to be very robust. They have to be able to handle all of this pressure because uh, the previous filters we looked at, the return filter and the intake filter, those were, uh, weren't really uh, subjected to very high pressures. Uh, so they didn't really need to be all that well designed. They didn't uh, need all that strength in order to, to handle it. Here you might, uh, you might risk having a system where your filter needs uh, to be able to handle 500, 600 bars easily. And that's, uh, that's quite a lot for a filter to handle uh, b because you get this pressure drop as you go across the, across the filter, of course. So, uh, so uh, the pressure has to be really high and uh, you, you can't, you can't uh, filter all that much uh, if you want to avoid too much of a pressure drop, but still you have to be able to, uh, to get it to the correct contamination level before it reaches the sensitive components. Uh, these filters, they have no bypass options, which means that uh, you don't have the possibility of, um, of having a bypass so that if, if the filter starts getting clogged and you're getting a buildup of pressure before the filter, so that you get a large pressure drop over the filter, you can't have a different valve that's opening up and letting, letting contaminated fluid pass the filter. That would sort of defeat the purpose uh, with this filter. Uh, but you, there should be a contamination indicator on a pressure filter because uh, uh, it's, if you put in a pressure without it, you have no way of knowing when you need to start thinking about replacing it. So there's not an, uh, an absolute requirement that they have contamination indicators, but they should have. <coughs> so we're going to look at some of the important characteristic values. So operating pressures up to 420 bars. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you can get them higher than that also. Uh, but just to have mentioned that uh, during these lectures, this uh, book has been written by a uh, hydraulic components manufacturer named Festo, a German manufacturer. Uh, which means that they are relating this to their own products often. So, uh, because I'm pretty sure that you can get them higher than this, uh, but the case here will probably be that Festo only delivers up to 420 bars, would be my guess here. But I'm pretty sure that I've seen them uh, at 550 uh, once they were rated for that. So, um, uh, we, we need to we need to take that one with a grain of salt, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, flow rates up to 300 liters per minute. 
So that's uh, that sounds uh, reasonable. I don't think that's uh, I don't think you can get much more than that uh, from other manufacturers. Uh, a degree of filtration, three to five micrometers. So these are very fine filters. They can get most of the contaminants out of uh, out of the fluid. And they can have a differential pressure up to 200 bars, but again, dependent on filter element type. And that's been for all of the elements that we've looked at permissible differential pressure. It depends on how the filter element has been built, uh, or how much differential pressure it can take. <coughs> so now we're going to look at how we can arrange uh, filters in the system. So we can have full flow filtering where we're sending all of the flow through the filter. It is also possible to have bypass filtration, which we're also going to look at a bit uh, more uh, later on, which basically means that you are filtering the fluid in the tank, so you're running it in a separate circle from the rest of the hydraulic system. So you have a different pump, which is pumping this fluid in a circle through the tank and uh, through this filter, so it's just going around and around and around. But the fluid in the tank is constantly being run through the system also. So it's never the exact same fluid that you're sending through this bypass filter. But this also means that you are filtering just parts of your hydraulic fluid uh, for each, uh, each go here so that uh, you, will have you will have contamination getting into your system. But it's a way of, uh, it's a way of keeping your, your tank fairly contamination free. And the filter arrangements are dependent on uh, the contamination sensitivity of the components in the hydraulic system. And the degree of contamination in the hydraulic fluid. So if you, if you have a system where you end up getting quite a lot of uh, contamination in the hydraulic fluid, like a, uh, an excavator, uh, I talked about these cylinders where you get, you have the piston going out of the cylinder and you have these scraper rings that are supposed to scrape off all of the dirt but there is always some dirt that gets past them and into the uh, into the cylinder and from there on gets into the uh, into the hydraulic fluid so that uh, the degree of contamination is very dependent on what kinds of components you have in your system uh, if you're running uh, several hydraulic motors in your systems, you will get uh, metal particles from, from your hydraulic motors because you won't always have 100% lubrication in place. So every now and then there will be small metal shavings that are, uh, are uh, uh, released from, uh, from the materials inside the motors. So there will always be, be some contamination in it. The filter arrangement is also dependent on costs. You can get very, very good filtration in your system, but it's going to cost a lot. So you don't want to do excessive filtration. If you have components that can handle uh, 10 micrometer uh, contamination particles, then you don't need to filter it down to two micrometers. That th there's no point, that's going to cost a lot more, so you don't need to do that. <coughs> so we're going to look a bit at um, different devices and uh, filtering concepts for them. So actual uh, piston machines, they have full flow filtering and you can either place it on the return line and or the pressure line. So either on the way back to, uh, to the tank on the, on the return or uh, right before the actual piston machine inside the pressure, uh, pressure line. Uh, or if you have a low pressure, you can place it just just on the low pressure line. Depends a bit on uh, on uh, the the uh, pressure uh, you have in your system. And they can filtrate up to uh, 25 micrometers. So they keep the contamination particles below 25 mi micrometers, basically. The next hydraulic devices, there's quite a lot of them: gear wheels, radial piston machines. Directional flow valves, pressure regulators, shutoff valves, and uh, working cylinders. So here you get um, two different concepts you can use. 
but you can't use either or. Uh, you have to use the full flow filter, but you can add a bypass filter as an additional. So you're going to use a full flow filter anyway, and then as uh, if you have an especially contaminated system, you can use a bypass filter as an extra precaution to try to keep the contamination level down. And the full flow filter will be placed on the return line, and the bypass filter will be placed on the suction line. And they can uh, keep the contamination particles below 63 micrometers. You can see they, uh, these kinds of hydraulic devices, they can handle quite a lot more uh, larger contamination particles than the actual piston machines. Then you have medium speed hydraulic motors. They run full flow filters on the return line and they have uh, contamination particles less than 25 micrometers. So for, for a uh, hydraulic motor, if you want it to be really efficient, you can't ha have very large gaps between the housing and the gears if it's a gear air pump, uh, if, if it's a gear uh, motor. Uh, you, you can't really have these large gaps between them, so you can't have very large contamination particles, or else you will have them uh, being crammed into places where they really don't fit, so they will uh, start damaging your equipment. So that's why it's, it's uh, lower there. However, if you have a, a radial piston machine or a, a gear wheel, then you can have, have larger. Uh, larger particles. <coughs> so now we're going to see uh, the different uh, parts. We have full flow filtering, which are the return filters and intake filters, which we looked at last time, and pressure filters, which we looked at a little bit today, and then you have bypass filtering. So first we have the circuit diagram. It's a bit small here, but uh, you can see it here as in being you have the pump, with its motor running it, it's putting pressure into the system, and on the return line we have the filter placed, so on the way back to the tank. So this, this line at the bottom here is, uh, symbolizes the tank where we are returning everything, uh, all of the fluid to, and also where we are sucking it up into the, into the pump. So the advantages of a return filter is that it's very cost effective and it's trouble-free maintenance because it's more or less like a uh, like a uh, oil filter for a car engine. You can usually get to it fairly easily, and you can replace it very quickly. Changing the oil filter and the oil on a car engine usually takes ten minutes if you're uh, an experienced mechanic. Maybe less than that also. It will take ten minutes overall because you have to have enough time to let the oil drain from it. But it's very very quickly done depending on the car, of course, because some cars can place their oil filters in really stupid locations where you have to dismantle half the car in order to get to the oil filter. But that's the problem of the engineers of that, uh, that uh, car company. <laughs> They're the ones that have been uh, not doing their job properly. But it's the same principle here, so you can basically get to it from outside the system. You don't have to start dismantling uh, uh, large parts of the system in order to get to it. The disadvantages is that the contamination has the chance to pass through the entire system before it reaches the filter. So you're only filtering after the fact. So that you are sort of dependent on uh, the hydraulic fluid in your tank here being at an acceptable contamination level. Uh, so, so that if you, let's say if this is a system that's been uh, not in operation for a while, so it's just been sitting there and uh, maybe some contamination has entered the hydraulic fluid. Maybe someone left a, a, uh, a lid open or something that you got. When you then start it up, you're going to run all of those particles straight through the system before they reach the filter. So that it's not going to help having that filter there because the particles will have done their, their damage already. But these are commonly used, and usually when you use them, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a hydraulic system that is used very often. It's not something that's used every now and then, every three or four months. So it's, uh, it's a system that's used at least on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis. And then you have a pretty, uh, pretty uh, good feeling on, 
I if the hydraulic fluid has been contaminated in the meanwhile. So here it's usually, usually easy to know. The intake filters, they are placed on the suction line before the pump. And that way you get to, you get to send the, uh, uh, to filtrate uh, the fluid before it enters the pump. And the advantage is, of course, that it protects the pump against contamination. So that if you have a, uh, a pump uh, or a system where you have uh, the possibility of getting very large particles, for example, in, in your hydraulic fluid that will damage your, that, that might damage your uh, pump, it would be wise to have an intake filter because then you could filter out these large particles before they hit the pump. But the disadvantage is poor accessibility and, of course, suction problems with fine filters. So they are useful for, for uh, filtering out large particles, so having large pores allowing a good flow through the filter. Then they work well uh, in the system. But as soon as you need to start, if you have a pump that is very contamination sensitive and you need to filter out the very small particles, it's not going to be good because it's going to, uh, it's going to act as a throttle point. So you're going to get a large pressure drop over it. And if you get a pressure drop where you have your pump, you, really, you only have atmospheric pressure before the filter. And then after the, pump, uh, after the filter and before the pump, you're going to get a vacuum. So that's not good, uh, uh, it's not a good design uh, possibility. It's uh, a high chance of getting cavitation uh, there. And of course, the poor accessibility is, if you remember the drawing we had of our tank, this one has to be placed inside the tank on the suction pipe that's going into the hydraulic fluid, which means that you have to dismantle quite a lot in order to get to it. You might even have to drain your tank of fluid in order to get to it. So it's, uh, it's a very large operation to, uh, to do this. And here is a comment in your book, which you can cross out, because it says that it can be used additionally as a coarse pump upstream from the pump. But th it makes no sense. You, you can't use a filter as a pump anyway. So me and Runal tried to figure out what they meant with this. Could it be just a... Uh, just a typo or something that uh, it can be used additionally as a coarse filter upstream for the pump or something. Uh, but we haven't really figured out what they mean by this. So we're going to, to just cross it out of our books because it's, uh, since we don't quite know what they mean, we're not going to regard it at all. <coughs> then we have the pressure filters, which we looked at uh, a bit earlier today where you have uh, the fluid coming from the tank through the pump, and then it's going to hit the filter before it goes into the components, which can be very useful. For an example, if uh, you're in a um, uh, running very fine hydraulics uh, for machinery, so you're using hydraulics that are hydraulic components that are very small, uh, but then you, you of course, uh, you can't use the same gaps between, uh, between the movable components in a very small, small parts as you can do in a, in a large cylinder, as an example. So you have to, you have, to have, uh, have smaller contamination particles because there are more chances of them being, being stuck. So in avi aviation, where they try to minimize everything as much as they can, uh, they use uh, pressure filters for their most contamination sensitive components. Uh, but also in, in uh, labs where they use lab equipment and stuff, where they need very small equipment when they're working with it, they, they use uh, pressure filters a lot. So they, can, uh, they can handle smaller pore sizes, which is uh, good for, for valves that are sensitive to contamination. So again, when valves become very small, there, are, there isn't all that much space to flow through them so that uh, you, you can very easily clog them up with contamination particles. But they, and they are very expensive, so that's a huge disadvantage. <coughs> and you also have to have uh, pressure-resistant housing. And uh, here it actually says that the contamination indicators are required for these. As we saw earlier, it said that we should have contamination uh, indicators. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I think it's a bit dependent on the system. 
some systems require that you have the contamination indicators, but there's not a requirement on the manufacturer of the pressure filter to actually uh, include a contamination indicator in the filter. Then we have the bypass filtering. So here we see the system as we've seen it earlier. So we have a pump sending uh, fluid into our components, going back into the tank, and then we have a separate pump that's just running the fluid in a circle through a uh, filter. <coughs> Which means that only parts of, of the fluid is going to be uh, filtered uh, at a time. But uh, the advantage is that you can use a very small filter and you can also use it as an additional filter just to get get uh, uh, get a more uh, a better a better filtering of your uh, system as a whole there is less contamination repulsion uh, which basically means that uh, you get to filter less of your fluid uh, compared to having the filter inside the main system as you would on the others so only part of the flowing hydraulic fluid is filtered. <coughs> yes? The reason why it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem would be... Yeah, yeah, you will you will get a pressure drop over it, especially if you have small pore sizes in it. So, so you will get a pressure drop, but you will have to uh, you will have to design your system for it. But as as we saw a bit earlier, they can handle pressure drops up to 200 bars, depending on the filter, of course. But you would have to uh, you would have to design your your system so that if let us say you uh, uh, it said 420 bar was the maximum allowable pressure. So if you're going to run this uh, cylinder in this uh, system at 200 bars and you need to use uh, such a fine filter that you're going to get the full, uh, full pressure drop over it, then you actually need to run your pump at 400 bars because you're going to lose 200 bars across the filter before you get to the, before you get to the cylinder. So that's a part of the hydraulic design. So so the, the, the filter can handle 420 bars. It's being run at 400 bars. And then after the filter, you only have 200 bars because the filter is sort of clogging up the flow uh, so much as throttling it down basically to, uh, to 200 bars. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why they are so expensive because you have to make them a lot more durable. So they have to have more, uh, more strength in the housing uh, and the filter elements uh, need also need more strength, so they need special care when they're being introduced. So it's not, it's not just a regu regular filter that you put straight into the pressure line. You have to have specially, uh, specially designed filters to put in there. <coughs> so a bit more about uh, filter arrangements. Uh, we have uh, two kinds of filters. We have surface filters, which are basically one layer which is filtering the contaminants. So we, if we have a flow coming from this side to the other side, uh, the larger particles won't be able to pass through the holes in the filter. So they will be, be, be stuck on the uh, intake side and only the smaller particles will be let out on the, on the outlet side. So this is basically just like a sieve that you use in your kitchen when you're when you're uh, making uh, food baking and stuff, so you would use it for your flour to get it, to get it uh, fine grained. And it's the same for a coffee filter and for tea bags. It's the same system. You have one layer of, uh, of filtering. But then you have deep bed filters or depth filters. Then you have several layers uh, that will stop particles from getting through. And as you can see from, from the two, two uh, figures here, you have a lot of large particles on the outlet side on this one, but here you only have fine particles. So I'm trying to visualize uh, how it works. And in the, in the depth type elements, they are uh, a lot thicker, and particles can actually get stuck 
uh, further into uh, the filter. They can they can get stuck. Uh, they can get almost all the way through the filter and then get stuck. They don't have to uh, all of them be uh, lying on the outside here, because like in in uh, in the surface filters, it is very easy to just clean the filter afterwards because you just need to rinse it. You just you just pull it out, and uh, most of the contaminants that have gotten stuck in it, they will be, they will be inside the mesh, and then you just rinse it so that you get all of the contaminants out, and then you can put it back in. So it's very good for, for for the coarse filtering, to to get the very large part particles out, but a depth filter is what you need in order to get uh, get down to a very very nice filtration level. And they are usually layered like this where they uh, where they are folding uh, folding the paper filtering paper that they are using so you can make uh, depth filters from from the same material as you're making tea bags and and uh, coffee filters you just have to uh, fold them like this and put them uh, in, in the same structure as these are because then you would get the get the same effect from them uh, but you can also make them from metal so you can make them from sintered metal, which is basically, I can't remember if I put it in here. No, I didn't put it in here. Uh, the sintered metal is basically uh, uh, metal particles that are uh, uh, locked inside of clay. And they heat this up, and the particles will start getting into contact with each other, and they will start to melt together. And if you continue this process, uh, at the end you will get just one block of metal one solid block of metal but if you stop it before you have gotten to the point where everything has melted together you will get these sort of formations which are very porous they're still made of metal but there's there's a lot of room uh, sort of canals going through it so they, they look a bit like those uh, um, I can't remember what they call but you have these uh, rocks that actually float uh, these um, not limestone but um, can't really remember the name of them right now, but there's a certain kind of rock which is very porous, and you can throw it in the water, and it's actually going to float because there's so many air bubbles and pores inside it, which is actually the kind of the same kind of porous rocks that is often uh, inside the reservoirs with oil and gas. <coughs> and it's the same system here that there's a lot of uh, sort of caves and uh, and ways for for, for um, the hydraulic fluid to pass through this metal if it's been sintered only part way not completely so that uh, depending on how how much it has been sintered uh, uh, it's going to determine how how uh, fine this metallic filter is going to be so that's uh, that's another possibility uh, compared to the paper types <coughs> As we've uh, already discussed, all filters will cause a pressure drop in some uh, way or form. And reference values for full flow filtering at operating temperature is for a pressure filter, you get a pressure drop of one to one and a half bar. For a return filter, you get a pressure drop of 0 0.5 bars approximately. And for an intake filter, you would have a pressure drop of 0 0.05 to 0 0.1. So the, the intake filters are the ones that, uh, that give the least pressure drops if, they have been, if the system has been designed properly. If you have chosen the correct, uh, correct filter, uh, you can allow it to, to be around this. But this also means for the intake filter, it means that you're going to have if you have one bar atmospheric pressure approximately in your hydraulic tank, it means that you're going to have less than one bar between the intake filter and the pump. So you're actually going to have a slight vacuum there. And that's why it's important to keep the intake filters very low on the, on the pressure difference. You don't, you don't want to, to get too much of a vacuum because that's going to increase the likelihood of cavitation. <coughs> We have different element types. So if we use uh, absolute filters, uh, we have these beta values. And if they are then 
Uh, if you remember, you can put in for X there, you can put in uh, the micrometers uh, of filtration. So we can put in, for an example, 10 micrometers. So if we have a beta value equals 75 for 10 micrometers in an absolute filter, it means that on, I think I went back here, it means that on this side of the filter, there's going to be 75 times more uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the 10 mi micrometer particles than on this side. So on the, on the, on the intake side of the filter, 70 time, uh, 75 times more 10 micrometer particles than on the outlet side of the filter. That's what this uh, beta uh, value uh, goes for. <coughs> and these are used to assure correct functioning and specified service life for uh, sensitive components, for servo valves and proportional valves. Then we have different nominal filters. So polyester, paper mats, metal and metal mats, 4 plus 4. They are all the way down to one micrometer. You can see you can, uh, you can have quite a lot of uh, quite good filtration on these. Uh, and they have very good contamination absorption capacity. So they can absorb a lot of contaminants before you have to replace them. And they have minimal flow resistance, so they were very good at that. And again, the assurance of correct functioning and specified service life. But now for less sensitive components. So even though they can filter quite long, uh, filter down to quite small particles, they're still used for less sensitive uh, components. Then you have wire mesh. They're only at 25 micrometers. And you have Dutch weave mesh, which is even larger particles. But they are particularly suited for flame retardant liquids and water because they use stainless steel as the filter material. So they are highly resistant to uh, differential pressure that has is, of course, goes hand in hand with being made from stainless steel, so it has a lot of strength, as opposed to paper. It, it can't handle uh, all that much of differential pressure. And uh, it also has good uh, contamination absorption capacity. Uh, and the operating temperatures can be above 120 degrees. Of course, if you run, run a paper mat filter at more than 120 degrees Celsius, you start risking uh, fire breaking out be because you're, you're closing in on, on the flammability of the paper. <coughs> so when we are talking about metal up here uh, in these filter types, we are talking about uh, the one we saw uh, in the previous slide, uh, the, the sintered metal, because that's, that's basically just grabbing a lump of clay from uh, a deposit and then starting to heating it up so that the clay is going to, uh, to just flow away and then the all of the metal pieces are going to melt together and becoming sintered. <coughs> but that means that you don't really have control of the metal, so you don't know if it's stainless steel or whatever. It's, it's going to be some kind of iron, most likely, uh, and it's not going to be pure iron because it's going to be contaminated by other uh, materials that are in inside the clay, but you don't know the exact properties of it. So using the, uh, such sintered metal mats uh, in uh, flame retardant liquids, which are often uh, have a high concentration of water in them, that's not very good because put iron and water in, it's going to rust like crazy. And then, then it's not going to work. But if you put ready-made uh, filters made of uh, stainless steel, so what they do is they, they create thin wires of stainless steel, and then they create those into meshes. So they basically weave them into meshes um, for these different types. And the Dutch weave mesh is just a particular way of, uh, of weaving it. <coughs> then we're going to look a bit more at the bypass filtering. See if we can uh, get this one done before the break. So we have a bypass pump with a delivery rate that is roughly 10% of the tank content. So it means that 
it can uh, can run about 10% of the tank continuously through the through the bypass filter. And that means that uh, at any given time you are only filtering 10% of the fluid that you have in your tank, but you also have fluid running through your system. So that there's quite a, it's actually less than 10% of your total fluid that's being filtered uh, at all times. Which means that if you are unlucky and if, if, if you have an unfortunate design on your tank and uh, bypass filtering system, you might risk uh, not enough fluid uh, uh, circulation in your tank so that you would basically be running the same same 10 to 50 percent of the fluid through the bypass filter and then you have 50 or so percent of the fluid that's just lying in the other end of the tank no, nothing's happening to it it's not being filtered at all it's just being sucked into the system again so you have to be if you're going to use bypass filtering it has to be as an additional filter you, you wouldn't want to use only bypass filtering on the system <coughs> and the filter has to be dimensioned to a minimum uh, pressure difference and the viscosity influences the overall uh, pressure difference of course so we have an overall pressure difference that we need to to, um, to calculate in order to to dimension our filter because then we need the pressure drop due to the housing of the filter and we need the pressure drop due to the filter elements inside the housing and then we need a, a viscosity factor and all of these will be specified by the manufacturer so that we will know what we are doing when we're calculating this. <coughs> so they will uh, most likely be in the data sheet uh, for the filter or maybe in the catalog from the, uh, from the manufacturer. So this is in order to, to calculate the overall pressure difference. This is what we need. So the, the pressure drop due to the housing will be the pressure drop due to the shape of the housing basically so the shape of the housing is going to uh, uh, affect the uh, the flow rate uh, and by affecting the flow rate and the velocity uh, we are getting a pressure drop it's not affecting the flow rate of course it, but it's uh, the flow rate stays the same because you're still pumping the same uh, flow through it but the velocity will change as it moves through the housing so you get a pressure drop there and you, of course, get a pressure drop as it's going through uh, through the filtering element itself. And then the viscosity factor, that, uh, that's something that's impossible for us to know unless we're given it by, by the manufacturer. So that's something they have to supply us with. So that's usually something they figure out uh, through testing. So they do loads and loads of tests in their laboratories as they are developing new filters. And then they uh, calculate the uh, the uh, viscosity factor that it's, uh, is for each of the filters. So then they use a, an average from all of their tests. So it is an uh, it isn't a a form a specific formula that they have. It's based on based on empirical results from testing. Then we're going to look uh, a bit at contamination indicators. I think we have time for it before the break. So if the contamination in the filter goes up, then the pressure upstream of the filter is also going to go up. <coughs> so here's, uh, here we have a uh, diagram of a um, contamination indicator, uh, basically a pressure filter with a contamination uh, indicator. So we have B here, that's towards our pump and our tank and A side goes to uh, our uh, equipment later on, our components in, in the system, whether it's a motor or a cylinder or whatever. We have the filter in the middle here, and we also have a check valve that allows uh, fluid to pass. So come to think of it, this can't be a, um, this can't be a uh, pressure filter because it, allows, it has a bypass option, so it allows fluid to pass the filter if it's uh, if the filter starts getting too full, it's going to uh, bypass it, which means that this has to be a suction filter. 
instead. So it's a suction filter with a contamination uh, uh, indicator. <coughs> so we have fluid flow. It's coming from B, entering the uh, uh, filter. It's also filling into this uh, piston over here, but it's, uh, it doesn't have enough pressure to uh, overcome the, the springs inside the piston. And it's also moving to the check valve, but it doesn't have enough pressure to uh, overcome the springs in the check valve. So it doesn't get any way there. And then it moves through the filter, comes out on the other side, and you also get uh, an additional force there because as we have, since we uh, have a very small pressure drop across this one right now, uh, we basically have the same pressure going into the filter as we have coming out of it. A very small pressure drop, probably 0 0.1 bar or something, that's uh, if I remember correctly from uh, suction filters. So over this one, we're only going to have 0 0.1 bar as a pressure drop. And 0 0.1 bar is uh, that, that steel spring in there is uh, probably, probably set, uh, designed to be able to handle a pressure drop of maybe three bars or something. That's often what they are, 1.5 to 3 bars uh, in uh, smaller check valves. Uh, so, so the combination of a very small pressure drop leading to having almost full pressure on this side, uh, helping, helping the spring along in, uh, in keeping the ball in place, will lead to basically no flow except through the contamination filter. I think we'll take a break. And then we'll continue on with this one afterwards.
Right, so we have fluid flowing through the system right now. And for the moment, our, our filter isn't contaminated. So the fluid is flowing straight through it without much problem. But then we get an increase of contamination in the filter. So we are starting to, to get more and more particles that are locked inside the filter and blocking the flow of uh, the fluid. And this creates an increased pressure before the filter so that we get more and more pressure here. We are starting to push this uh, indicator out. Yeah, that was that, that one. <laughs> So the, the pressure is not yet high enough to activate the check valve to let the, uh, let the fluid through uh, on the check valve side, but it is high enough to start, start giving an indication uh, in this piston. So you can actually read off uh, the position of the piston here. So that's what's telling you if it's starting to get, uh, get contaminated. So then we get much more contamination inside our filter so it's starting to get even more clogged up with uh, contamination particles. Then we get even more uh, pressure upstream. So now we are getting uh, a full, full indication that uh, we, have, we have a completely, uh, completely dirty filter here. And also the, the check valve has been opened up and the fluid is flowing straight past the filter. So now we have full flow going past the filter and almost nothing going through the filter. So unless, uh, unless the operators of the system actually check their, their uh, contamination indicator, that's how the system is going to be until the filter has been changed. <coughs> so we, uh, need to, we need to be able to uh, determine the differential pressure of a pressure filter. So we're going to do a example here need the uh, overall differential pressure. So we have a filtration degree of 10 micrometers. We have a flow of 15 liters per minute. So this is on page, see, uh, page 64 in your book. And we have a kinematic viscosity of 30 square millimeters per second. And we need to use this formula where we get the overall pressure difference by getting the, over, uh, the pressure difference of the housing plus the pressure difference of the element multiplied with the viscosity factor. So first we need to figure out the housing, the pressure difference on the housing. So then we have this one, uh, uh, this uh, graph we can look at. If you look here at 15 liters per minute, which is our flow, we have liters per minute in, uh, on uh, this axis. So 15 is where we need to go. We go up to the curve and then over to the side. We see we have approximately 0 0.25 bars of pressure difference in the housing. And then we look at the filter element. Again, we have liters per minute in the uh, lower axis. So we go to 15 liters per minute. We go up to the correct line. Uh, in this case, it was 10 micrometers. So it's this red line here. We go over here and we see that we have 0 0.8 bars of pressure difference on our elements. And, and we look at the viscosity factor. And we have a kinematic viscosity of 30 and it's the kinematic viscosities and that's on the horizontal uh, axis here. So we find 30, we go up to the uh, curve and then we find that it's approximately 1.2. Yeah? The, the pressure drop in the housing is basically the, the, uh, the shape of the housing. So it's everything apart from the filter element. So, so you have, uh, you have uh, your hydraulic fluid is flowing through the filter housing. It's also going through the filter element, but the filter element is inside the housing. So going through the filter element, you're going to 
get a pressure drop just going through these uh, porous parts of the filter. So usually it's these paper parts that have been uh, folded and put in a, in a cylinder. But the rest of the housing will also cause uh, a pressure drop. So you get a small pressure drop for the re from the rest of the housing also because it's going to change the velocity of, uh, of the flow. And when you change the velocity of the flow, it's going to be increased because you get a uh, most likely be increased because you get a, a smaller cross-sectional area uh, when you're when when the flow has gone through the filtering element and everything it has a smaller cross-sectional area often when it's when it's going out of the filter so then it gets a small pressure drop there also <coughs> so that's the difference between between the housing and the element it's basically just the shape of the housing determines a bit how the pressure drop is going to be so you could uh, you could in theory uh, design a housing which gives you almost no pressure drop at all but again it's going to with as you can see on the curve here with increased flow rates you will get some pressure drop almost no matter how you design your uh, your filter housing because you can see if, if we have a very low flow rate if we only had five it would be practically neg negligible we, we probably couldn't uh, couldn't measure uh, the pressure drop from the housing so you have a very very small pressure drop when you have a very low flow rate but then as you increase the flow rate you get more and more because you get a higher and higher uh, velocity going through it because the dimensions of the housing isn't changing so the only thing that's changing to increase your flow rate is the velocity that it's going through it and that means that the uh, design of the housing itself will have more impact on the velocity the more the velocity is increased <coughs> when we put uh, these three together inside uh, there we get 0 0.25 bars plus 1.2 multiplied with 0 0.8 bars which gives us an overall pressure difference of 1.21 and the overall pressure difference is what we could measure if we had a pressure gauge before the filter and a pressure gauge after the filter. But instead of, instead of actually measuring the pressure difference, we usually just calculate it and we leave it as a, as a calculated value if, if we're designing, a, 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 if we're choosing a filter for our, our hydraulic system. So uh, <coughs> if it's very critical, uh, that you get a specific uh, get a specific uh, differential pressure, then it might be might be useful to hook up uh, a test pressure gauge before and after uh, when you are actually when you're actually building your system after you've designed it and when you're actually building it, putting uh, together all of the components, it might be useful to to just have two extra pressure gauges and put them in and those in there just to check that this value is correct or more or less correct at least it depends of course a bit on how since it's just 1.21 bars it's uh, depends very much on the pressure gauge if you're going to be actually going to be able to get a useful reading of it so many pressure gauges are, uh, are use are used on fairly high uh, pressures so it can be difficult to to to, to see that small of a change. <coughs> but that's, uh, if you do work with hydraulic systems, it's something that I would recommend that you do. Uh, basically, that's no matter what you do as a mechanical engineer, if you're designing anything at all, whether it's hydraulics or just purely mechanical stuff or even stuff that is uh, highly entrenched in the electronics world, if you're creating housings and stuff for, for electronics components, just ask your employers if you can, once this is going to be actually built, if you could please be allowed to, to join the technicians and the mechanics and the electricians and everything that's doing the work. Because that's, in, in my view, that's invaluable experience to actually get to be there in the workshop and see the stuff that, that you've been calculating and uh, thinking about and designing, all of the theory that you have gone through in order to learn this and then get to be in the workshop and see this put to life. And most likely, 
the technicians and guys that are, are, are building this stuff, they are going to teach you quite a lot about it because they know a lot of stuff from experience that we can't learn through theory. But the point is that we don't have 10 years to use in a workshop before we, <laughs> before we start being an engineer. We, we, can't, uh, we can't do that w when we want to be an engineer. Uh, so then we just have to try to, to be uh, on a team with, with, uh, with the people that are actually doing this physically. Because they, they usually have quite a lot of, uh, uh, quite a lot of knowledge experience-wise. They might not know why stuff acts the way they do, but they know that this, if I do this, then that is going to happen. You would probably be able to put the theory behind it. Well, if he does this, then the theory, of course, says that that is going to happen. But it's something else to see it in practice because the result might be a bit different from the theory. And then it's up to you to try to figure out what do I have to compensate with in my theory? What, did I, and what, what was it that I didn't think of in my theory for this one? Like if you, uh, yeah, like, <coughs> let's just do a basic physics example. If you throw a ball, uh, across a field and you get a trajectory, you can calculate this trajectory using, uh, using uh, forces and uh, vectors and everything. So you can calculate and uh, uh, more or less say exactly where the ball is going to land. But most likely when you actually throw this ball, it's not going to land where you calculated that it was going to land. So what was it that you didn't take into account? Was it wind? Was it uh, air friction? What was it? So it's uh, uh, it's uh, quite nice to have this connection to, uh, to the practical stuff when it's being done. <coughs> so now we've looked at filters and we're going to go over to the coolers in the power supply section. So cooling might be, uh, might be necessary in many systems because we do get this friction in our fluid flow which results into heating. So we get pressure and energy that is converted into kinetic energy and heat. And very often we want an operating temperature of a regular hydraulic system. We want the operating temperature to be below 60 degrees Celsius. So in a, in a uh, car engine, we want it to be around 100 degrees Celsius but that has to do with the combustion uh, cycles. So that, uh, we are actually running the, the uh, motor oil in, in the car engine, we are running it in above normal operating temperatures. <coughs> uh, but of course we have to, it's the combustion that has to be the, uh, be the main, uh, main priority uh, for an engine. For a regular hydraulic system, we want the operating temperature to stay below 60 degrees. So the cooling equipment we can use is, for an example, an air cooler, which is basically like an, uh, the radiator of a car. So you ha you're sending your, your uh, hydraulic fluid through a radiator piece, and there's a fan connected uh, to this one, which blows cold air onto the uh, steel steel mesh of the uh, radiator piece so that the, uh, the, the steel of the radiator is going to absorb heat from the uh, hydraulic fluid as the fluid passes through all of the pipes that go up and down through the, uh, through the entire uh, radiator or the air cooler in this case. And then uh, as you're blowing cold air onto the steel, the cold air is going to, uh, the heat is going to be transferred from the steel and into the air and the air is being moved away replaced by new cold air. So that's how you, how you uh, end up keeping, uh, keeping it colder. And you can manage up to, up to 25 degrees of the temper uh, temperature difference with an air cooler. So if you, if you have a system where you end up with an operating temperature of, uh, let us say, 80 degrees, then you can uh, attach an air cooler and you get, get down to, uh, can get it down to 55 degrees so that you're within your operating temperature. If you get more than, more than uh, 85 degrees in your operating temperature, you have to seriously consider a water cooler because then an air cooler isn't going to be enough, so you are going to need, need the water cooler. And then it's more or less the same principle 
as the air cooler, only now the radiator is submerged into water so that you have water transporting the heat away. And then you have usually have some sort of pump system that's circulating the water so that you get, get fresh cold water uh, onto the uh, radiator at all times. <coughs> and then uh, you can also, if you get even above that, if you start reaching uh, hundreds of degrees in operating temperature, you will have to use liquid cooling. And it's not the same as a water cooler, of course, because then you are using uh, refrigerants, same, uh, same as you would use in your freezer or refrigerator at home. And then you can do quite large amounts of heat, because these can be uh, very much uh, designed fit for purpose. So you would uh, basically look at what your operating temperature is and how much, how much uh, do you need to cool it, and then you would design the, the cooling system from that. So you can just upscale it if you need to, need to cool even more. And there you have the, uh, the, uh, the heat pump and refrigerate refrigeration uh, chapter from, uh, from the thermodynamics comes into play when, if you're going to dimension something like that. <coughs> so here we see a, uh, an air cooler. So it has the, uh, the fan with the fan blades going around here, and then you have all of the, the uh, radiator stuff on the opposite side there. So it's blowing the air through it. And here is a, a water cooler. So you have all of these small tubes that are in here uh, get filled with the hydraulic fluid. So the hydraulic fluid is flowing through them. And then you fill this entire tank with water. So you're pumping in fresh water from one side and pumping it out on the other side. And here's a good, uh, good example of it so that you get the, the uh, hot oil coming into these pipes that are inside it. They go through the pipes, and at the same time you have cold water coming in at the opposite end and going out as warm water on the, uh, on the other end. <coughs> so for an air cooler, the hydraulic return will flow through this pipe coil that is inside the radiator, which is then cooled by, by a fan. And the uh, clear advantages of using an air cooler is that you have a minimum of operating costs and it's a very easy installation. So you can basically just connect it to your uh, return pipe to the tank and then you're done. So you have to plug in the fan into uh, to the wall socket so that you get some electricity to it, but that's, that's all you need to run this one. Of course, the disadvantage is that the fan is going to make noise. So if this is in a room where people are working, uh, then you have to think about that, uh, what, what's going to be the noise level uh, in that room. <coughs> but usually uh, the pump from the hydraulic unit is also going to make quite a lot of noise so that uh, if it's the fan or if it's the pump that's making the most noise, I'm not quite sure what would be the worst, basically. It's going to make noise anyway. So for the water cooler, the pipes through which the hydraulic fluid flows, uh, and you have pipes uh, through which the hydraulic fluid flows, and then around the pipes you have the, the water running. And it would be the same principle if you're using refrigerants also, so that you, you would have the refrigerants flowing outside the, the uh, hydraulic fluid pipes. And you can get large amounts of heat, lo uh, heat loss can be dissipated and you don't get any disturbing noise from it. So that's a, that's a clear advantage with, with a water cooler. But you do get higher operating costs, uh, especially if you're not using water but you have to use a coolant in order to get the, uh, the uh, uh, correct amount of effectiveness from it. Then the coolant is, of course, a lot more expensive than just using water. And then you have uh, the corrosion problem, of course, because you have submerged it in, uh, in water. And also uh, the problem with contamination, because since you have corrosion happening because of the water, you can also get uh, corrosion ending up inside the pipes so that you, uh, you can get contamination inside it without really realizing it. So you can have corrosion ending up creating a small hole in a pipe 
where you will all not only get oil into the water, but you will also get water into the oil, so that you get uh, get get water in your hydraulic fluid, which isn't good. And that that can be uh, difficult to to uh, to actually uh, notice because you might not notice the oil in the in the cooling water until you've gotten quite a bit of it and it's gotten a chance to flow to the top. So uh, it might take a while before you actually actually realize that you have a contamination problem. So that can be a problem with a with a water cooler. And then we're going to look at, at the heater. <coughs> so for heating, it is often required to heat the hydraulic fluid uh, in order to quickly reach the operating temperature. And this, of course, has to do with gaining the correct viscosity uh, of the hydraulic fluid. Because as we looked at in one of the first lectures, the viscosity changes as the, uh, as the temperature changes, which means that we get, uh, if we have quite a high operating temperature, for an example, if we are, uh, have an operating temperature of uh, 100 degrees Celsius and we are cooling it, uh, back going back to the tank in order to keep, keep the tank below below uh, 60 degrees Celsius, then we might actually need to, to, at least when we are starting up from room temperature, we might need to use a high efficiency heater just to begin with so that we can get the hydraulic fluid up to the correct temperature. Yeah, so it's in order to ensure that we reach the ideal viscosity. And we often want uh, specific temperatures when we are doing it, so we want uh, 35 to 55 degrees in the tank if it's a stationary system, so like the one we have in the lab where it's, it's just placed there, it's not going to be moved in any way. And if it's a mobile system, a truck or an excavator or anything, we want it to be between 45 and 65 degrees in the tank. <coughs> so now we've looked through through all of the, uh, the components of the power supply section. I, I could uh, mention that. It, it's basically the same, same system as, uh, as for, for the cooler, only uh, in this case uh, you are heating the, the pipes and the hydraulic fluid is on the outside uh, of the pipes. So you're sort of reversing it. When you're cooling you have the hot hydraulic fluid inside the thin pipes and you have uh, the cold water on the outside. But when you're heating it, you have, uh, uh, have the cold hydraulic fluid on the outside and then you have the heating elements inside these small pipes. And whether it is uh, preheated water that is run through them, uh, if that is an option, especially for a stationary system, that might be an option that uh, you actually have access to to uh, hot water that you can use to heat it. Um, especially like if, if, if this is a large industrial site and maybe you have actually, uh, actually a gas turbine somewhere, then you will have a lot of cooling water from, from, from the gas turbine. You can use utilize that wat hot water to, to heat your hydraulic fluid in any systems. <coughs> but also for, for mobile systems, it might be be differently. It might be actually a burner that is uh, on the outside here that's burning some of the fuel for the engine that runs the hydraulic system. So it might actually burn some of the fuel in order to gain heat to put put through this uh, uh, through the heater, or it might do it electrically so that it actually has electrical wires, uh, heating wires that are pulled through these pipes, so that it's going to to heat the pipes, uh, the steel of the pipes, basically. So that's also different ways of doing it. Uh, there are also some newer ways. I'm not sure if you've seen these um, kitchen taps where you can have cooking water. So you're kind of boiling water coming out of your kitchen tap if you want to. You have to connect it to a special uh, electric circuit in your house. So usually if you have an older house, you have to rebuild your electric circuits and get new uh, fuses and everything because you need uh, uh, higher capacity on your fuses because it pulls a lot of it pulls a lot of electricity when it's heating the water, but it's not doing anything uh, when you're not heating the water. So if you're running cold water, it's not doing anything. 
So it's a very, very, um, it's a very energy uh, consumptive process when you're using it, but most of the time you're not using it so that it's actually saving energy compared to having a uh, hot water boiler in your, uh, in your basement, which is keeping uh, uh, several hundreds of liters of water wa hot at all times. Uh, but they use uh, sort of the same system where it's basically almost like a miniaturized version of this one where they are sending uh, a, a very thin flow of liquid through all of these heaters. And the heaters are very, uh, very efficient. That's why they need all of this uh, electric power. Uh, and just by sending it through this, uh, the box can basically be of the size of your book, uh, just a bit thicker. So, so a box like that can be enough to, to actually uh, heat, heat all of the water that's coming out of your tap up to boiling. And the same can be used with hydraulic systems. So uh, it depends a bit on how, how new these systems are and what, uh, what kind of uh, uh, energy sources you have available with how you're going to heat them. <coughs> yeah, and then we're back to, to this one, uh, which we started off with. So we've been through the drive, the uh, how we're, if it's an electric drive for a stationary system or a combustion engine for, for a mobile system like this one. We've been through the pump and looked at different, different pump types, how we're going to pump the pressure up in the, in the system. We also, when we looked at the pump, we looked at pressure relief valves, how those work. Uh, we looked at the couplings between the drive and the pump and how they can be made of elastic materials in order to, to negate uh, different fluctuations either in the, in the motor or in the pump. We looked at the tank and how the tank is designed and how it works. Uh, we've looked at the filters now recently and today. And we've also looked at the cooler if we need a cooler in it and a heater if that is necessary. So. <coughs> For an example, if, if you remember when we looked at this one the first time, uh, I mentioned that this one is used on, uh, on airplanes, for testing airplanes. So you could imagine that this one probably needs some sort of heating. Uh, it doesn't say anywhere here that it has any, any heating capabilities, but I would think, uh, depending on uh, where in the world it's placed, if it's placed in, in uh, the northern parts of Norway, or in Canada or, or Siberia or somewhere where it's cold, I would imagine that it has uh, heating capabilities so that it actually heats the oil uh, before, they, before they pump it into the, uh, the system of the airplane to test it. Um, yeah, and there's one more thing that we, ha one, one thing that isn't listed here in, uh, in the power supply section. So, so it's not listed in this list that we have there, but it is a part of the power supply chapter in the book, which is the accumulator. And we do have an accumulator in our lab. Uh, so that's the, the, the uh, red part there. <coughs> uh, no, we're, we're going to do the accumulator uh, next week. That w uh, no, on Friday. That's uh, how it was, yeah. So today we've gone through pressure filters. We've become familiar with those. We've also become familiar with different filter arrangements, so ways of arranging your filters in order to, uh, to get the best effect from them. We've also looked at bypass filtering and looked at the, uh, how to calculate pressure differentials. We've become familiar with contamination indicators and how you can use the fact that you are going to get a buildup of pressure before, before the filter in order to tell you that the filter has been contaminated. We've looked at how we can use uh, information from a manufacturer to determine uh, the d differential pressure uh, of a filter. And we've looked at cooling systems and we've looked at heating systems. Then we have a couple of uh, references here. So I think uh, we're just going to leave it there today.
Uh, I've got a pretty sore throat, so I think I'm going to <laughs> give it some rest. <laughs>